Right, thank you very much. Uh, morning, everybody. So, in advance of this conference, Mark Wilson, the chief executive of Aviva, recorded a podcast, and I hope lots of you listened to that. Mark really did have to be in China today, um, but we, we, we bent Sarah's arm uh, to be here with us. Sarah is the, the leader of the people function, never known as the HR function, only ever known as the people function inside Aviva. So we're going to explore the story of Aviva for 15, 20 minutes or so, and then hopefully we will have time for some questions. Uh, we've got one slide I just wanted to show you, which is just, Mark would have talked about this if he'd been here, but just four numbers to try and kind of calibrate uh, the turnaround that's been achieved at Aviva. I, I, I'm never that kind of sure about prizes that are given out, unless they're for tweeting. Uh, but last year, uh, the Evening Standard voted um, Aviva as the UK Business of the Year. I mean, those, those prizes can disappear just as easily as they appear, so we need to be careful with them. But th these are the kind of numbers that underpinned that perception. Maybe the first one is the most important one, certainly to investors, which is the share price is pretty much doubled, slightly more than doubled over a few-year period. I have to crick my neck here. Uh, the profit after tax, uh, it hasn't gone from 3 billion to 1.6, that's a minus 3 billion. So a few years ago, you know, 31,000 people and lots and lots of shareholders were experiencing a, a reduction in value of that business every single day. The profit, as it were, was a, a negative number of 3 billion. That's been turned around to a 1.65 billion profit. So, you know, an almost 5 billion turnaround in, in terms of returns to society and to employees and customers and shareholders. Uh, the digital customers, it, it was a little bit difficult to measure, but there wasn't a lot of digital action uh, a few years ago. We've now, it's even difficult to measure today, but there's about 7.5 million customers who interact with Aviva primarily through the digital channels. There's also other channels available, but their primary impulse is doing it digitally. That's good for them. Uh, Aviva is an omni-channel business, so they can choose how they interact and they choose to do it that way, but it's also good for Aviva because the cost of servicing customers in that way is much lower. And then turning, lots of people here are interested, obviously, in the people aspect of this, and that's what we'll explore with Sarah. Turning to the employee engagement stuff, Aviva's always been a loved business. You know, it, a few years ago, 68%, lots of us in the room would be quite envious of a 68% engagement number. There's nothing wrong with that at all. But you'll often hear people say, um, you know, as, as, you, as you take the hard actions to drive performance up, engagement will go down. Well, not true. You know, the, the hard actions were taken, share price, performance, profitability, cash, they all went in the right direction, but engagement <coughs> went up rather than down. So, that, of course, it wasn't a straight line, it was a very wiggly line, lots of difficulties along the way, but it, it's gone very well. Uh, the, the big question is, what does the future look like, not what does the past look like, and can the momentum be continued? So that's what we want to explore. So, Sarah, I've got 28 questions here, but really there's only one that matters. <laughs> How? <laughs> How was that achieved? In the next 14 minutes. Yes, please. Um, so I think there's a number of things that we've done. There is no silver bullet, firstly. I mean, the business was in distress. The numbers tell us the business was in distress. And the first thing that had to be done was fix the balance sheet, because without that, we have no business to do anything else with. If you know anything about financial markets, our solvency two ratio back then would have been totally unacceptable. It is where it is now with the surplus capital we've got, and that gave us license to do other things. We got out of some markets. We have a strategy of not everywhere. And as you know, that's not just about product proposition. It's about country. So we got out of, we went from 22 to 13 markets, which we just sold Spain. We just finalized the deal on Spain. So that's our final exit of a market. It's made us a much simpler business, much more, I guess, easy to run. We don't have flag-bearing locations anymore. Um, and we, we really took our costs down. So we thought hard about where we needed our resources and how we might run the operating model differently. I guess the last thing we did was change 80% of the top team. So, in a way, what you've said is you've got... Um, <laughs> no, I didn't miss that either. Uh, 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 I'll be coming to it. Um, so, you, you've described, you know, the perennial... You, you, could, you could talk about business as all you have to do in business is revenue up, cost down, cash in, and risk out. We're done. We can go home. And that's kind of what you've done, and it's produced those numbers. It, it, most businesses don't do that. Right? Most businesses kind of... In fact, if you take the FTSE over the last 15 years, the average value creation of the FTSE has been 1.2% per year. 
right? So not doubling, 1.2% a year. So how, go one level deeper, what, what was needed to be in place in order to provide the momentum and the fuel for that kind of radical transformation? Look, there's lots of things we, we could talk about in, in that space. One of the things that always strikes me is the alignment to the vision. So when Mark got there and it was as broken as it was, he was really, really clear about the vision. And here we are now with 83% of our colleagues, that's 83% of colleagues worldwide, 35,000 of them, see a connection between what they do every day and the vision. I don't think we would have turned the business around without that alignment, really top to bottom. But it required us to really live with paradox. There were some very difficult messages. So you still will hear today, we've got to take expense out, but we need to grow the business. We've got to rationalise our portfolio, but we want new propositions. Whichever way you looked at parts of the business that needed to be fixed, there was a paradox to be debated, and not everybody found that easy. So there was a huge leadership challenge getting people to manage in that ambiguity in that grey period. That's really interesting. I've heard you talk about that a little bit before, but let's just explore it a bit more. In kind of entrepreneurial, smaller, fast-paced businesses you might expect that kind of mental agility to work with paradox to be more present. But I think I'm right that Aviva insured Sir Isaac Newton, right? So it's a while ago, I think 310, 320 years. Before I was born. Even older, <laughs> even older than I am, right? So, and you've really? got 30, 31,000 people, something like that. So, and you're spread across the globe. So working with paradox and ambiguity and kind of relishing that kind of ambiguity is not a natural default setting for a big insurance company. What did you do to trigger that capability? Yeah, it's a, it's a really valid point. I mean, we have, we have a high length of service in parts of our business. Not everywhere, actually. Our digital business, our Aviva investors, and asset management business, much lower lengths of service, much yeah. newer talent. But in, in parts of our business, it's not uncommon. If you go to York or Bristol or Norwich, where we've got thousands and thousands of people, there's lots of people with 40 years' service. So how do you get them to come with us? Um, gosh, there's a few things we've done. Again, the alignment, I think, is key. We spent, in the last particularly 12 months, 18 months, a huge amount of time together as a top team, getting really clear on where we're going next. And we stole the Amazon phrase of disagree and commit. That's made a big difference because at moments of truth where we've had to turn left or right with a market or a proposition, we've all as a team been together on it. And I think that has been a big shift culturally. I think the leadership accelerator, which of course you know well because you've designed it with us, but the leadership accelerator it has become a little bit of an Aviva I guess, signature, I'd say. Um, so we took our top 300 people. We've put them through an Aviva Accelerator, which is four modules over two years. We're about to go with module three. It's high value. It's extremely high value content. So it's taught by a mix of professors, plus our executive team, plus a number of other external people. It's, it's got the most incredible feedback, and it's really shifting leadership. It, it is purely about retraining the leadership of the organization. To do that, we have simplified leadership expectations. I'll, I'll never forget when I, um, we were there, stood on stage about six months ago now and said, we're bringing to get together today the new leadership expectations because when I asked the question what we expected of every leader in Aviva, whether they managed 3,000 people in a call centre or a country, somebody showed me a 137-page booklet. And I have absolutely no idea what it says. We now have four on a page. That's it, one page, whatever size of leader you are. And that's made a big difference um, for us. I think talent has been a huge shift for us, and, and people are here today to talk a lot about talent, but we have really chased down this idea, and you heard Lord Holmes talk a little bit about the shift in talent. In fact, Lord Holmes came and talked to my own function a few months ago. We talked a lot about the shift to this digital future. And, you know, we use the phrase, you can, train, you can train tortoises to climb trees, but it's really quite hard, and sometimes you need some squirrels. We've gone after that really hard. So we have taken, uh, the example I'm using at the moment is quantum. So something called quantum, which is our data science practice. 600 data sciences, scientists. People wouldn't believe that of a business like ours. But we have 600 data scientists. These are world-class data scientists. Most of them were people who'd studied data science in one form or another. But we've actually taken some actuaries and successfully retrained them because the fundamental skills underneath it were not that different. And you have to believe in the future world of work. You can retrain people to do a different role in the future of talent. Mm. I think you know, that's been a big part. I guess the final thing is, is something called signatures, which you know a little bit about. 
Um, we have four things that we believe are competitively differentiating for our business and, and mark us out absolutely anywhere in industry and, and some of our outside industries, actually, and they're the reasons we win big deals. So I think there's a number of different things we've done. You, you've talked there about some um, kind of powerful interventions that are kind of positive and developmental, <coughs> right? Invest in leaders. I know you did a lot of work on changing the structure to make it more kind of rational. Mm. Invest in signatures, leadership expectations. But just going back to when the audience kind of uh, giggled, you know, that there is the other side of it as well, which is being quite tough-minded about who's on the bus, yeah. right? And, and as you said, there's been a lot of change at the top, uh, and there's been some change below as well. So uh, maybe this goes back to your point about paradox. How do you think about investing in the developmental capability of the organisation and addressing underperformance at the same time? So... <clears throat> That question really gets answered by data, data, and more data, and then using it in, in, in an insightful way. We have we've used a number of tools. So we've used a, a tool to measure our culture, the OAQ tool. But we've, with more than that, we have now got the benefit of seven sets of time series data on the capability of our leaders. It's an amazing set of data, as you've seen. Yeah. And we pulled it together in something we talk about as readiness to lead, and we were able to really forensically look at the capability of every leader. Now, that's not for the faint-hearted, and it is certainly provocative. It divides people on, on how and what you should use that for. But what it's enabled us to do is to look at that top 300 and say, who are the leaders we should invest in? And frankly, who needs to change? And then who don't you think can change and make some tough decisions? And I, I honestly think that's our job to do that. Otherwise, we're letting the organisation down. Those 300, don't forget, lead 30,000 other people. It, roughly speaking, out of the 300 people who were at the top of the business two years ago, how many of them are still there today? About 30%. Uh, sorry, we've changed about 30%. Changed yeah. about 30%. Yeah. And if you look at the top team, which was 13 people, I think, and it's now 10 people, how many of them are different? Uh, well, in more interestingly, how, will, how many of them will be different? No, that's a different thing. <laughs> <laughs> the keeper of secrets, I'm afraid. Um, yeah, so what we Mark changed 80% of the people. So, you know, there are, of the 10, there is now only one person who was at that top table back when he got here. Well, when you take all those, uh, I was going to say bits and pieces, they're more than bits and pieces, <laughs> but those, that kind of intervention strategy, what are you aiming for? What kind of, um, let's call it culture, what, what, what's the... The, the end state, if there is such a thing as an end state in the business anymore, but what kind of culture are you aiming to create? Well, when we, <coughs> excuse me, when we ran our OAQ, and you already know this, but it told us that we set some new lows uh, on some of the dimensions, which is always an enlightening moment with your board. So we set a new low. We were more complex than NASA. It's hard to believe that. We were more complex than the NHS. That's even harder to believe. Um, but yet we've gone after it hard. So simplicity is, is our single biggest focus. And if you looked across the group executive objectives right now, we all have a, a, a numeric simplicity objective for the year. Collaboration is another one. So we think about parts of our business like our UK insurance business and our global asset management business. We need them to work much more closely together. Uh, speed. So we have to get out the door quicker with innovation. We have to get out the door quicker, which is why we've got our huge digital business now stood up. You know, several thousand people sitting in our digital business. Um, and then I, th I think lastly, being able to have a culture where people can learn from what goes wrong and what does work and what doesn't work, that's quite difficult in a risk-based business historically. So we've started to change the dialogue around what taking really good risks mean. Well, you, you could kind of get on the bal <coughs> excuse me, you could get on the balcony and you could, in a way, what you're trying to do is use the people and organisational dimension as a competitive weapon. Right? And, and you, because you are a people and risk-based business, which is about making literally thousands of risk-based decisions every day, if you get the people dimension wrong, you, you know, you're off the pace. So, so that I love. How does that fit with something else I know you care deeply about, which is inclusivity, uh, both customer inclusivity, uh, the, the uninsured, but also, the main thing in my mind is employee exclusivity. You've changed 30% of the top, but you do have an awful lot of people who've been there 20, 30, 40 years. You're probably not going to change you know, a large portion of those. <clears throat> so what role does inclusivity play in, in this kind of hard-headed, financially-oriented and customer-oriented transformation? 
It's a, really, it's a really great link to put inclusivity and risk together because we really firmly believe, and I see examples of this every single day, that where you have groupthink, you have poor risk taking. Yeah. So part of the antidote and part of the reason for taking better risks is when you can have more diverse thinking in a room. I, I absolutely believe this. I've seen it so many times. Some of our coolest product development recently, Ask It Never, came from one of the most diverse groups of people you can imagine. Diverse in every background. It's easy to talk about protected characteristics, but we actually think a bit more about diverse from the markets they've worked in, diverse from the customers they've probably served. Um, so it's a, huge, it's a huge red thread, I'd say, that runs right through our business. Yes, we do lots of things that loads of organisations in the room will do. We have absolutely got a well-established strategy on it, and I, and I think you know, there's a lot of people very proud of that. But for us, it's much more about the thought process. It's much more about how you get better decision-making as a result of that thinking. Um, and, and since you mentioned you know, the uninsurable customers, we have, a, we have a huge social purpose for uninsured customers. I, I was talking to Maurice Tullock last night, who... CEO of International, and uh, we were talking about uninsurable customers in Canada because of the horrific wildfires they've had there. You know, what do you do about that? How can we play our part in helping people feel like they won't have to take that risk on their own again? How can we influence government to have... There's a complicated government scheme behind it. How can we do things that help people feel less vulnerable? Just, if I can just slightly go off piece for one second. It, it is... If you're going to, so. <laughs> yeah. It, it's unusual for the HR director, chief people officer, to be driving a, a commercial transformation of this scale. Normally, they play an absolutely critical support role, <coughs> and this kind of transformation is driven more by the chief operating officer, sometimes the strategy director. But it's unusual for that to happen. Sure. How, do you, how, how do you manage that? How do you feel nothing, about yeah. it? Have question. you made a big mistake? Yeah, it's a good question. There are moments where I reflect on that. Um, no, I, the thing that Mark is really, really good... So if he was here and you asked him that, he would say it was obvious. I would say he's really good at putting people where talent and passion lies. So, you know, there are other members of, of our team, other executive colleagues of mine, who have things that are maybe not necessarily traditionally part of that role. Yeah. But, but I think he's really, really good at that. I had a passion for transformation. I had a passion for change. I seem to have an ability to get things done that are more difficult. And he deliberately wanted it done differently. He didn't want it done in a very typical sort of carrot and stick way all the way through. He did want it done from a cultural perspective. The chairman was very concerned about how the board would take their responsibility, their regulatory responsibility of culture forward. So he wanted it to sit together. Um, and look, I mean, we had the first year to prove if we could do it, and I'm very, very clear he would have taken it away and given it to somebody else if we had screwed it up. So it, it seems to me to kind of broaden that that the HR community for 40 years has been saying, "Give us a seat at the table," and now your bluff has been called. <laughs> so if you if you sat in my um, people conference where Lord Holmes was with us a few months ago, you would have heard me in, in one of my I think I did an opening say, you know. We've won that battle a long time in this function. It's a massive privilege to be part of this function because that debate is long over in our business. Nobody questions it. They wouldn't dream, none of my CEOs would dream of doing things without their people partner. They just don't. But make no mistake of the responsibility that leaves you with. So this is not for the shy. This is not for people that don't want to understand our business and can't, don't know how we make money and don't understand our customers. Because if you're going to be at that table, then you really do need to have a view, and you really do need to be a business leader. It, it suits some and not others, and you know, I'm lucky. I've got, you know, I would say, the best team out there who can do that. But it is definitely a different way of thinking about it. Great place to stop and have some aftershave. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but no bromance, no bromance. Uh -huh. Fantastic. Um, uh, there's so many questions I want to ask about how that transformation, the legacy that's left within the... You know, but now is your chance as the audience to continue the conversation. Any questions from the audience for either of our panellists, actually? Um, please, if you have a question, I need you to introduce yourself, your organisation, and then your question. And we have one here from the front row. So waiting for a microphone just Is to come to you. Microphone? He's testing out his Usain Bowl moment here. <laughs> Or maybe the Olympic walking then. <laughs> uh, hi, I'm Rachel from Pecon. Um, and I was just interested to understand that you've obviously got engagement up there with share price and profit. How important is that for your leadership team? And how do you manage to keep that so high across 30,000 people for that much change? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. I think there are two reasons it's important to our leadership team. And the first one is that 
when we've looked at businesses that we've exited that had, had poor profit, poor margin, poor customer outcomes, engagement was always low. So nobody needed convincing of the case that engagement led to a better business. And the second one is, frankly, everybody's paid on it. So, you know, that might sound crass, but any of you that, that do my role know that the things that you put into executive remuneration are focused on primarily, not secondarily. Mm. And we've done that for a number of years. So it's absolutely part of the scorecard, but more than that. And then the other thing we've done, you know, I, I have a fantastic team, some of whom are with me today, that work on this. It is part of everything we do. In fact, we were just saying this morning, in Voice of Aviva, which is what we call it, is part of every single piece of communication, every single piece of training, every single piece of strategy that we run. It's in there. So it's become very much how we run the business. Any other questions? There's a gentleman just over there. They're really make it, they're being annoying on purpose, I think. And yeah. Please, once again, your name and organisation and then your question. Just in the corner there, gentleman with a blue shirt. Yeah, um, I'm a John Fletcher. I'm um, L&D director for MPC, which is a VFX production company. Um, one of the questions I had is you've got, as I just mentioned, you've got employee engagement up there. What were the key metrics behind that 75%? What did you base that 75% on? That's a question that would take me about half an hour to answer to do it any justice. So it's, it's a very, I guess, complex set of metrics, but we break it down into 10 factors that we believe absolutely make the difference between discretionary effort and non-discretionary effort. And then, like many organisations, there's a whole set of questions that sit underneath that. The brilliant thing about this, and, and the reason you couldn't pay me enough money to change my survey provider, is that not only do we have seven sets of time series data, which is hugely valuable, mm. but their data analytics capability, I mean, you would say the same, and you've seen yeah. a lot, yeah. is world class. So I can ring them with pretty much any question you can think of, and they will be able to give me a data-led answer to the thing that I'm, I'm thinking about for any market in the world. So. Uh, final question. <laughs> a final question from the lady here. Hi, Claire Webb from Costain Limited. Um, you've gone through a massive period of change. I'm just wondering with the talk about mental health and well-being, how you've dealt with pe people reacting with stress, anger, um, and just mental health through such a disruptive period. Yeah, brilliant question. So we have um, we've spent an awful lot of time and, and resources, I guess, in this area in the last year, particularly. We were signatory to time for time to change earlier last year. Um, you know, we have a business that has a number of possibilities that create stress. So change creates stress, and organisational challenge like that creates stress. But you also have to reflect, you know, we have people sitting in call centres whose only day job is to answer a call where somebody's either being diagnosed with terminal cancer or worse, they've just witnessed a fatal car crash. That's all they do day in, day out. Mm. It's a high-pressure environment. So there's a lot of sources of stress, and we've invested differently in different parts. So in those places, we've invested heavily in real occupational mental health support. It's, it sounds trite, but it actually really works. It makes a difference for those people. Um, we've invested heavily in well-being more generally, so we have lots and lots of different well-being benefits depending on the market you're sitting in, whether it's simple things in the office environments or whether it's the benefits we offer people so they can take more time out. Our carers policy was a big part of our mental well-being push last year because we knew that 80% of our people felt they had a caring responsibility they couldn't adequately perform. So there's a lot of different things we've done, but we take it pretty seriously. Um, and, I, and I think we're starting to see, we've just seen the biggest reduction in people feeling undue stress at work since we started measuring it five years ago. Mm. Could I just briefly add to that? One of the things that Aviva did that I think took a, a great deal of courage was that in the UK there were four vertically integrated businesses and it didn't kind of make sense. Um, and you, you made the brave decision to integrate those businesses in a way I won't bore you with. And one of the concerns was, my goodness, that's an awful lot of change. That's thousands of people changing their reporting lines, lots of regulatory issues with it. Uh, you know, how, how are we going to be able to manage through that? Well, two interesting outcomes. One is that the, the organic growth went from 2% to 9% in the first half of this year. So it's a pretty good outcome. But the other thing, more related to the mental health, is what, what's clear from our surveys is the dysfunctionality of the old structure was causing a great deal of stress. Right? People were trying to work around structures that just were bonkers. And so being brave enough to address that thorny issue 
There were certainly transitional challenges with it, but the, the answer was far better than the old answer. So I would just encourage us to think that stress is a function not only of what you do, but also what you don't do. Pe people were subject to stress by working in an environment which hadn't been properly thought about. And our final question is up on top there. Hi there, it's uh, Anthony from Fizzpop Bang here. Um, one of our um, other speakers earlier on today mentioned the Industrial Revolution and um, financial services sector and insurance are, are one of those sectors that are um, probably likely to be hit by the developments in that. Um, you've already mentioned how you've retrained actuaries to become data scientists. Uh, I'd just be interested to know um, what else you're planning to do in the future to help your organisation bridge that gap um, where automation, uh, automation and AI, AI might start to take over within that. Yeah, I mean, I don't think it's that we will be. I think we already have been. And, and actually, our, our aim is to ignore everything else that's going on in our industry and to disrupt ahead of it. So there's a number of things we're doing, and some of which I'll tell you about, and some of which we won't. Um, <laughs> we have automated already a significant amount of the work that we do, low-value work that enables people to do much higher-value judgment-based work. We have a business called Aviva Ventures, where we invest in um, two things. We invest in either technology or people that we don't think we have and don't want to make ourselves, or cool new ideas that we think might disrupt the sector. And in fact, I'm just back from a trip to Tel Aviv where we saw, I, I think Chris and I saw about 20 businesses that we think we might do something with one way or another. Um, and that's a bit about you know, where, are we, where are we going next? You have to remember we've got customers at the end of all of this. So it's all very interesting to get very excited about disrupting your own industry and being leading in that. But you absolutely have to be able to bring your customers with you. And so we are all, in every industry, I think, somewhat dependent on how willing our customers are to come with us, which is why Colin talks about us being omni-channel. If all we did was digital, we'd lose a lot of our customers. So there, there is a balance to be had, but uh, we are very firmly in the, we're already doing this, and let's not wait for anybody else. Fantastic. Please, ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together for Colin and Amanda. <laughs>